the EBTN news on this uh, workers party day or uh, whatever you want to call it the um, whatever the Francis Vatican would call uh, a day celebrating workers um, anyway I got the day off so I'm not complaining today we have uh, more news not a lot again uh, not a ton of stories I you know there's always news stories but I just choose not to talk about most of them um, so let's start out with Father Antonio Spadaro SJ age 57 uh, he's uh, he said that Christ's word to the Canaanite woman in the Bible uh, that he is sent to the lost sheep of Israel uh, the, the word that he has sent to the lost sheep of Israel is stymied and callous. He's the edit, uh, Spadaro is the editor in chief uh, of La Civil, Civilta Catholica.com. He's an ally of Francis, and he wrote that mercy is not for the Canaanite woman, I believe it's the woman at the well, and that Christ's conversation was marked by the cultural rigidity of the time. Spadaro is convinced that Christ uh, responds mockingly and disrespectfully to the poor woman and appears as if he was blinded by nationalism and theological rigor. The woman had to convert him to himself, and just as her daughter, Jesus too, appears healed and finally shows himself free from the rigidity uh, from the dominant theological, political, and cultural elements of his time. Well, this is absurd blasphemy by Spadaro, S.J., but do you expect that the Vatican will um, crush him, or remove him, or um, cancel him? No, he'll get promoted because of this. Just, uh, just watch. Just watch and see what happens. Meanwhile, Catholics like Strickland, uh, they're, they're under a little bit more of a threat from modernists. So there's that. Moving on, the SSPX is building a large church in Gavrus, France, uh, a village of 600 inhabitants outside of Caen, France, C-A-E-N, uh, in France. The church is modeled on an 18th century building. It costs only 1.6 million euros and will be finished by 2025 and is financed by the faithful. And, he, uh, and this is really the important thing. No new, tr no new church has been built in the area since Vatican II. And now this church is coming along. So the SSPX is... Um, really making some progress. And if you look at the church, it's a decent sized church. I don't, it's not quite the scale of the Immaculata, but it's nothing to shake your head at. It's, it's a big, it's a decent sized church for a village of 600 inhabitants. Of course, maybe that was their intent to build it somewhat outside of city limits and uh, in more of a rural area to maybe create a community, sort of like St. Mary's, Kansas. There's a traditional Catholic, uh, community there. So good on the SSPX. Okay, so one of the last few weeks I talked about Laudato C si Part 2. Um, Francis reiterated at his August 30th general audience that he will publish another document on the environment, the second Laudato C, si, on October 4th of this year. I'll talk about that in a second. For Francis the victims of environmental and climate injustice, and he wants, he, he wants to strive to end what he calls a senseless war on our common home. So October 4th uh, runs directly into the Synod. So I wonder if this, uh, in this document, the second Laudato Si, will blend together with the heresies of the Synod. Um... Now, I, I speculated and I said, you know, quote me on this. There's a possibility that this could 
uh, look to overturn Humana Vitae. So, mm, and, and of course the Synod is uh, taking a look at that kind of stuff as well. So if they would go hand in hand, it certainly seems like it's, it's possible. I don't, I can't comment on whether it's likely, but uh, certainly a possibility. So stay tuned for that. See what happens with that. All right, in, in uh, very predictable news, the sexual assault charges against Theodore McCarrick were dropped on Wednesday after a Massachusetts judge ruled that he is not mentally competent to stand trial. So really shouldn't be surprising, but this is a win for Francis, for Supich, Tobin, McElroy, Whirl, Gregory. This is what they've been working towards. For five years, they've been working towards this. And this is what happened. It's particularly a win for these guys because the heavily uh, censored McCarrick document that the Vatican released, or heavily... Mm, was it censored? I don't want to use... I don't know if I really want to use that term. But uh, it, it definitely didn't include all the information, for sure. Um, there were definitely a lot of people who he has promoted that are still in the hierarchy. And the document did nothing to address any of those... Um, any of those, uh, whatever you would say, claims, uh, any of those concerns. So we have a, a generation, a McCarrick generation in the hierarchy which is really despicable, um, pretty disgusting. Bishop Nestout was a former secretary of McCarrick, and now he's in charge for the protection of minors. Wow. At the USCCB level, that's, that's pretty embarrassing. Um, yeah, it's a win for the Francis Church. And will we ever find out the truth about McCarrick? The truth will come out eventually. Um, James Grine, the victim of McCarrick, was very disappointed. And McCarrick is living, apparently, at some seminary. George Neumeyer was kind of on that case, and now he's not, obviously. So, I don't know. We'll have to rely on mainstream media to break the news, and who knows if McCarrick paid them off. There's, there's certainly, um, certainly a possibility. Yeah. What about the politicians and the death of, uh, I don't even want to say his name. I might get him targeted. But, uh, he was the guy who was friends with a bunch of politicians, you know? Uh, they, the, the famous phrase is, whoever didn't kill himself. Yeah, you guys know who I'm talking about. All right, moving on. Leftists, uh, left-wing Catholics, have sparked outrage and mockery for accusing Scott Hahn of schism because he expressed gratitude for a new pastoral letter from Bishop Strickland in a Facebook post, not this past Friday, but the fall, but the previous Friday. Uh, Scott Hahn shared Bishop Strickland's message released last week, adding simply, he said, I am grateful for Bishop Strickland's inspiring words. In the letter, Strickland reaffirms seven basic truths that the church has upheld from time immemorial and warns of possible efforts to change those truths through the synod. The bishop's letter also predicts that many of these truths will be examined as part of the synod on synodality and urges Catholics to hold fast to these truths and be wary of any attempts to present an alternative to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, Regrettably, it may be that some will label as schismatics those who disagree with the changes being proposed. And I, I read this um, in a previous episode. He said, Be assured, however, that no one who remains firmly upon the plumb line of our Catholic faith is a schismatic. So these leftists were in a demonic rage because of Scott Hahn's 
um, seeming endorsement of Bishop Strickland saying, yeah, we might be labeled as schismatics for defending the Catholic faith. That's where we're at. Of course, if you look at these leftists, uh, they really, you know, they, they spend quite a bit of time on Twitter. In fact, I don't know how they can even do that. I don't even know how they can spend so much time on Twitter. Uh, these people, they just, it's, it's crazy. It's really insane, actually. Um, don't they have anything better to do? Like, I go outside and take a walk. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe they're on Twitter while they're taking a walk. I don't know. Um, I, don't, I can't imagine that they would work or get any work done. Um, well, they spend so much time on Twitter, but anyway, their their follower counts, which is a big deal on Twitter. They have very few followers, and of course, mostly mostly non-Catholics uh, because of their mm, because of their leftist agendas. I mean, obviously, you're not Catholic, but um, yeah, I mean, they they have very small follower counts, yet they post so much that uh, people take notice, uh, you know, Catholics take notice of these fringe leftists and they are outraged and that's sort of what Twitter wants is the engagement. So the more heretical, t I don't even know if these people believe in some of the stuff that they post, but the more heretical their takes are, the more the outrage is. And it's just not great. I mean, it's, it's really just not a great, uh, not, not a great series of events. For you to get outraged over something a modernist is posting, I mean they're modernists, and modernists are heretics, and so there's no reason to worry about it. They're, uh, I mean, they've basically excluded themselves from the church at that point. I was not going to do much, so um, better to read some theology from before the 1960s and just you know move on with your life. All right. In Brazil, during an August 28th Eucharist in Londrina Cathedral, Brazil, the little Archbishop Jeremias Steinmetz, age 58, handed communion to Sheikh Ahmad Salah Mahar uh, Maharai, founder of Lorinda's Ray uh, Faikel Mosque. That's right, he was a Mohammedan. And the bishop, the archbishop, gave him communion. Media reported that Mahari didn't consume the host. What did he do with it? In an August 30th note, Steinmetz, the archbishop, justified his action by absurdly referring to quotes from Francis and the, uh, that the Last Supper was undeserved. You know, the Jesuits, uh, they're pretty good at this. They're pretty good at saying... When Judas received communion, well, guess what? Judas wasn't a public sinner. That's the problem. This guy's publicly a heretic. This Mohammedan's publicly a heretic, and now I think the archbishop. Would he be a heretic as well? Would he be a public heretic for um, publicly uh, committing sacrilege? That's a good question. I, I wouldn't want to be in that archdiocese because uh, that's certainly scandal. And, but this is what the Francis Church is, is coming to. I mean, it's communion for everyone, even those outside the church. But they don't believe anyone's outside the church. So we're, we're really entering an era of confusion, for sure. Um, not only confusion, but just um, bold. Uh, bold's actually, bold could be a positive term, but um, uh, obvious, blatant heresy. All right. And so I'll talk a little bit about the Francis trip, maybe just a little bit. Just before the first ever public Eucharist in Mongolia, Francis visited there this past week. Uh, it was at Step Arena on September 3rd. Caramel butter popcorn was served. Was it caramel for Our Lady of Mount Carmel? Haha, <laughs> that's really not much of a joke. But they serve popcorn. For this public mass. Like, you could buy popcorn and go to the mass. <laughs> I mean, is, is, is that really, is that fitting for the Novus Ordo? <laughs> anyway, Francis ended his homily 
by rehabilitating the heretical French, French Jesuit Pierre Tillehard uh, de, de Chardin, uh, who promoted eugenics and wrote his Mass on the World in the interior of, the interior of Mongolia a hundred years ago. The Holy Office censured Tillehard's works in 1962, calling him, and so Francis called him often misunderstood and said, and he quoted him, the Mass is celebrated, is always celebrated in some way on the altar of the world, whatever the heck that means. Um, but in 1962, that's interesting, because uh, John the Twenty Third was Pope at that point, and the Holy Office censured his works. You know, I believe, was it John the Twenty Third who condemned Sister Faustina's diary? Ooh. That's controversial. But they censured, uh, yeah, Til, uh, Tilhard de Chardin. Uh, they censured his works. And so Francis ended up quoting him. So he might as uh, But he has a statue of Martin Luther in the Vatican as well, and the Vatican issued a postage stamp of Martin Luther. So what does that say? Um, it says... He believes that no one's outside the church, so there you go. Um, anyway, Francis visited Mongolia, and I, I did see that at one point, he, um, I think he he praised Mongolia for their def or for their environmentalist policies, even though Mongolia, uh, Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, is apparently the most polluted city in the world. I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I, I know it's certainly very polluted. Um, he, he said that he, I, he said something along the lines that Genghis Khan, the tyrant who killed many people and raped a lot of women, to the point where a quarter of the descendants of, a quarter of the population of Mongolia is a descendant of Genghis Khan. Um, that he was like a promoter of interfaith or ecumenism or whatever he said something along those lines and everyone was like what are you talking about um yeah francis he met with buddhists and he quoted the buddha so there you go that's pathetic um really bad i mean come on we have saints, and we have, like, the Catholic Church has saints, and he quotes Buddha. <laughs> I guess that's better than quoting Pachamama. Um, and what was the last thing? Oh, he, he met with Mongolia's leaders and talked about nuclear disarmament. So Mongolia is going to pledge to not build nuclear weapons, I guess. I, I don't know. Um, but they don't have the capability for nukes as far as I know. And quite honestly, it's a pretty undesirable area. I mean, they have mostly nomads in the country. It's a large, you know, a decent size country. Um, the land is, like I said, it's inhabited by nomads. It's kind of like a very cold area. Um, some of it's near the mountains, and so it, it is cold and there's nomads and kind of a dry land, uh, difficult for farming, so it's just really kind of undesirable in the grand scheme of things, sort of like Russia, a lot of Russian territory, like especially Siberia is pretty undesirable land, which gives them an advantage uh, geographically. Because no one really wants their land. If anyone would take over Siberia, I mean, Russia would be like, why do you want it? Like, <laughs> I don't know. But, um, yeah. So he visited Mongolia for an interfaith ecumenical service, and he quoted Buddhists, and there you go. All right. Happy, goofy, secular holiday. Uh, like a quarter of people in Central Asia. Oh, okay. Well, um... Yeah, so that kind of just shows the uh, the high character, well, the, the quality of character of Genghis Khan. I mean, I guess, you know, most people can't claim that a quarter of a population of a 
region as their descendants. I mean, yeah. Although uh, in the in the Old Testament, I guess uh, marriage wasn't a sacrament. So King Solomon had like a thousand wives or something, and uh, a lot of the polygamy was not only tolerated but encouraged. Uh, Jacob, Israel, uh, he had 12 children to like four different wives, I believe. Wives, concubines, whatever. And uh, that was widely accepted as a, you know, just a, a, a practice, like a tolerated practice. So polygamy was was tolerated in the Old Testament, but yeah, I mean, just their descendants. This, this Genghis Khan, I don't imagine he had wives. Just a brutal tyrant. So, um, you know, that's, that's just how it works. So Mongolia, what a great place to visit, but <laughs> I don't know. I watched some documentaries on it. There's no highway that connects to it. Uh, the, the capital city of Ulaanbaatar, they have, I think there's a stretch of highway for 100 miles, uh, like east to west or something, and that's it. And the highway ends, and then it turns into dirt roads, and then nothing. So you can go off-roading if you want to get anywhere. But otherwise, you're kind of stuck in this capital city, and that's it. <laughs> It's an interesting, really kind of an interesting country. Um, all right, the countdown to the Synod has begun. We have a month. Countdown to Laudato Si Part 2 has begun. We have a month. Man, it'd be cool to go there if you were a billionaire, I guess. I mean, there's a lot of places in the world that would be interesting to visit. Although I heard, with the pollution that I heard about, I don't think I'd be too incredibly excited to go there. And, well, there's quite a few cities, though, especially in places that are not as developed as, like, first world countries that have some pretty terrible pollution. I think Mexico City is very polluted. And probably some cities in China, India for sure. So, it's just, uh, I don't know. I'm not, not really a fan of pollution myself, like air pollution. The air quality is really bad. And polluted water, too. I mean, you can't drink out of, like, the tap water in some of these places. So, I don't know. I mean, international travel, just not, not too much for me. I'll stick to maybe going to Canada. That might work. I don't know. Um, seems like a good place. My, uh, our friend, uh, the Canadian Northman is from Canada, so it can't be that bad, right? I've been to Canada before, Niagara Falls, it's technically not real, I mean, technically that's not really even, no, technically it is Canada, but not really, because <laughs> I, when I, back in my, back in the day, I think the last time I was there was before I even needed a passport, but I, I jumped across the border, and uh, they, they took American currency, <laughs> although they charged Canadian prices, so if you're paying 20 bucks, I mean, 20 bucks in American, you know, U.S. currency, it's like, yeah, sure, they'll take it because the Canadian currency is, you know, higher, uh, it's the equivalent of a higher price. So 20 Canadian dollars is probably more like, I don't know, maybe 18 U.S. dollars. So they're making a profit. So, of course, they're going to take um, United States currency. Of course, my, I use my, I think it was a debit card at the time, debit or credit card. And I got charged like a 1% foreign fee, which to me was worth it. Because then I wouldn't have to worry about the currency exchange. But anyway, that's that's getting way uh, off topic. Uh, let's see here. I've been to India. It's absolutely maximum pollution. <laughs> Only Japan and... Oh, I'm not even going to read that. Only Japan and other countries seem to do environmentalism and conservation. Well, it's not even really environmentalism, it's just not polluting the air. And apparently Pittsburgh was really bad, like 30, 40, maybe 40 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. I mean, people tell stories about, you know, from this region, people t tell stories about going to Pittsburgh and <laughs> seeing the smog hanging over the city and 
now you go there and it's a really really cool view i mean the you know the highways don't make much sense but uh just a very very cool uh looking city with the bridges and the tunnels and um, you know the city skyline views but uh <clears throat> Upstate New York had some bad pollution, I'll bet, I'll bet. And thankfully they've cleaned that up a good bit and our, our areas are, you know, much more uh, convenient to live in in terms of the air quality. So, all right, well, this has been EBTN News. Um, until next time, stay cool. It's really warm here. Stay very cool. <laughs> and uh, we are the laity and we will not be silent.